Hello, everybody. Welcome to Super Agents Live. Uh, this is for, if this is your first time here, welcome. And what we do on the show, I interview top producing real estate agents, coaches, and authors. And I dig into their business so hopefully you can learn what they did to become successful and uh, and what not to do because you, know, you, you fail along the way as much as you win a lot of times. Um, and look, if you are like what you hear, I would say to do two things. I'd suggest you do two things. One, uh, go to our site, superagentslive.com. Uh, download my book. It's called How to Sell. Get in my funnel there and and subscribe on, on iTunes uh, and or Stitcher. Now, look, before we get into the show, I want to talk to you. I don't, I don't usually share a whole lot about myself, but today I feel like I need to. Now, this episode is getting uploaded late. I've had a horrendous last seven days. Now, last week, I ended up, I was on the East Coast uh, for a big real estate event, and I can't tell you what event because the uh, the organizers swore me to secrecy. Uh, it was a very, very closed off event. I probably should not have been there, but but I was. So, and I got to hang out with, you know, my buddies, like Bob Corcoran was there, and Chris Spiker, and Tom Ferry, and, you know, so I got to, I got to hang out with a lot of people around my show. Now, here's the deal. Last Tuesday, I was like, okay, I'm going to go to this thing. So, I get, I get on the, it was in the morning time, I get, uh, look for flights. I book a flight for the next day to San Diego to the East Coast. Now, for, I pay 1200 bucks for this, but I'm like, okay, that's fine. I was supposed to get into town at 5.20 p.m. I got in at 12.20 a.m., and, I, and, and I've been traveling since 6 a.m. that morning, 6 a.m. to 12.20 a.m. Ridiculous, uh, but I get into town. Guess what? I go and go, where's my bags? Uh, they're not here, sir. They ended up in New Jersey. Now I was not going to New Jersey. I'm like four states away. So brutal. Anyhow, way, uh, I, I get my stuff the next day and I go to the event and it was fine. Now I get back. Now, if you're listening to this on the day that this airs, now this will air October 14th. Now you've heard people in the show say swallow the frog. And if you don't know what that is, that means whatever you don't want to do, that's the first thing you should do. Get it done and over. This is not bad. Now I'm normally personally, I'm normally pretty good about that. Uh, but uh, the one thing I'm not are my taxes. I wait to the last minute every time I just, I don't know, I, I have my CPA filing extension or whatever. Now, here's the deal. Here's why I'm not, I'm not feeling great today. <clears throat> and here's why. Now, uh, um, normally all my income, all the stuff I make money on, I run it through my corporation. Uh, this year, I actually got a personal 1099. Now, and this 1099 was for $343,000, right? So I owe taxes on, on just on this thing, personally, $343,000. Now, obviously, like uh, my old CPA used to say, hey, Toby, tax avoidance is okay. Tax evasion is not. So, you know, it took sort of a, you know, I'm like, how do I wash this off? Now, I ended up, I had, I was, I've been having this thing kind of in my back pocket, <clears throat> I did a, a private placement deal uh, um, four or five years ago. Now, if you don't know what a private placement is, um, uh, and, and look, this, this is stuff that mainly only wealthy people can do. You have to be an accredited investor. You have to have you know a million dollar net worth at least or make like 300 grand a year, something weird. But <clears throat> so I did this private placement deal um, and uh, I put 240 grand into it. Now, if you don't know what a private placement is, it, that is, it's a private company and you can invest in that thing. They're raising money uh, because they want to go public. Now, they're super risky. Um, so that you either are a big winner or a big, big loser. Now, in my case, I threw 240 grand in uh, and uh, I hedged my bets. I did 120 on the personal account. I did one, another 120 on my business account. Right Again, thinking about tax planning. Um, at the end of the day, this thing goes bad. It goes haywire, right? So my two hundred and forty grand, you know, you know, I ended up selling it off. I got twelve grand out of that. So, but okay, you know, I win some, lose some, and uh, so I give it to my CPA because I'm like, I'm going to use that two hundred forty thousand dollar loss to offset a two, or I'm sorry, the three forty three gain. And through this process, uh, uh. You know, they, they they went through name changes. They went through reverse stock splits, and uh, and she doesn't. She's not seen these. She's like, I told you, I don't know what to do with this. And I'm like, listen, just put it on, just write it off, because I don't want to pay taxes on the full 343. So it's October 14th. I'm waiting for my CPA. Hopefully, she can get her head wrapped around what this thing is. And because, uh, dude, let me tell you, if I get a double whammy, if I lo- if I have to pay, if I lose two hundred forty grand, then pay taxes on that two hundred forty grand, and then pay taxes on the three forty three, um, that's not a great week. So again, my last seven days have been 
a little bit gnarly. It's not even been seven days. It's actually been, oh no, it has. It, uh, it's been six days. Tomorrow will be seven. So, oh boy. Hey, guys, uh, thanks for listening to my rant. I really, really needed to get that off my chest. Um, and that's it. Okay, let's get to the show. Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents have built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. Yeah. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate yeah. entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Yeah. Today's super agent is Roy Cleves. Now, I talk with Roy, and what we talk about today is how he works with investors. He goes out and finds investors. He goes out and finds a house that is undervalued or not, and he puts the investor together with a house, and then they go find somebody with kind of maybe crunchy credit or you know not ready to buy, but they do a rent to own. Now, we talk about how he advertises, how he markets this, as well as how he you know puts this all together and it's really an interesting thing you know it's a win win for everybody the buyer wins they get a house which they otherwise would could not the investor wins they get a very very safe investment that kicks off you know 6% annually it's not a great great return but you know it's safe money uh and 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 obviously the seller you know uh well they sell their house so uh i think you're going to like this one again it's it's a little bit different which i'm trying to you know i bring this kind of stuff up to you guys every now and again you know mix it up uh, more than just you know getting top guys on here saying, you know, go do radio marketing. And by the way, hey, if you are doing 100 transactions, you want to get to 200, talk to me about doing a radio. It is a magical thing. So I can only put one agent in each market. So again, if you want to uh, to see if, you know, it works for you, uh, send me an email. Let's, uh, let's go through it. All right, let's get to it. Hey, Roy, thanks for taking the time out today. It's my pleasure. So listen, I've given the audience a brief overview of your background, but maybe take a minute, tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Yes, for sure. Well, one thing that's very different that uh, I've really come to do a lot of business in here uh, with my real estate business is rent to own. So I specifically advertise for people that cannot get a mortgage right now, yet can get a mortgage in about three years from now. And then what I do is I, I work with investors that really appreciate in on average about a 20% return on their investment that's secured by the real estate. And they are helping these people that have a blemish on their credit and cannot get a mortgage right now, but in three years from now they can. And it's truly a win-win situation for all of us involved because those people that um, cannot get a mortgage right now are able to move into a house, save towards their down payment, improve their credit, and not have to move again. And they know that every month as they pay, they're paying a portion towards their down payment and they're going to live in that house and own it three years down the road. For the investor, like I said, they're secured by the real estate so they don't really have too much to worry about. Because the tenant wants to own the house, they take good care of the house so they don't have to check in nearly as much and they love the return that they get. So it's a it's an investment strategy with an exit strategy already in place. So it's a win-win for both parties. Interesting. Uh, so yeah, let's dig into that because I have, <clears throat> I'm doing that right now with a property and I wanna, I wanna talk to you about how I did it. But let, let's go back for a second. So, so you know, the, you have the, the buyer and the seller side. Now, do you, how do you do this? So you find, uh, an investor, and then find the house, or do you find a house and then find the investor? How does that work? Uh, we prefer to find the tenant first. Huh, okay. So it's neither of those other two. Yeah. So first we find a tenant, and I advertise specifically for people looking for rent to own in a number of different ways, including signs on regular houses that I have for sale, because it helps open up more buyers as well to that home. And of course, I do some magazine advertising, a lot on the internet, and of course, uh, word of mouth in my own market here as well. So what happens is we find the tenant first. We 
look at their credit and we want to make sure that three years down the road, they're going to be able to um, get the mortgage. And we also take a look at their debt service ratio because we want to make sure that what we're setting them up for a payment is not going to be too cumbersome for them, that they can actually afford that payment. And then that way we can have a successful outcome. So once we find the right tenant, then we're going to start to go shopping for the right house. And the main thing about that home is that we need to make sure that it's a quality home that will appreciate in value so that the investor will get a return. Because the way the investor earns their funds is by selling that home to the tenant three years down the road at a higher price than what the tenant uh, could have bought it today. Okay, interesting, man. Um, okay, so you so you have as part of your business is a typical traditional real estate. You know, I'll list your house and I'll sell it. So so when you uh, hold open houses for those traditional sales, you are you're baiting people into you're getting people in and and uh, buyers and and promoting this rent to own. Is that I just want to understand the mechanics. Yeah, that, that is correct. We have uh, brochures that we'll hand out at the open house that also talks about rent to own. However, that's probably not where we get the biggest source. The, the biggest source is really from the internet because the people are, are seeing it there when they're thinking about it or from the house itself. And what I mean by that is when we put up the for sale sign on the house, we also put up a sign that says this home's also available for rent to own, call for details. So then the people will call me and they say, well, I like that house and tell me about how this rent to own could work for me. Mm-hmm. And, and so, but, um, so I like that house. Um, I, the, the, and, and, you know, if I understand Roy, that there's a rent home program that goes along with this property, the next question is how much is it? Oh yes. Well, the purchase price is still basically going to be sold at, at market value right? And the investors are the one buying it. And I explained to the sellers, it doesn't really matter to you as a seller, whether the family that moves in here actually owns it or whether it's an investor that owns it and the family that moves in is going to buy it three years from now, as long as you get your money now. So you're still going to get your same money from that investor at the fair market negotiated price. Yet, it'll be a rent to own system for the people that are moving in. So they all understand that, you know, they're still selling and they're just selling to an investor instead of the, the uh, family, traditional family. Right. No, no. I meant that in a different way, Roy. So I'm saying, so I see a house that, that I, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, I, I, my credit's not good. I want to buy a house. I'd love to buy a house, but I can't qualify. So I'm going to do this rent to own thing. How, how you explained it, that it works to be a second ago was that, 36 months from now, three years from now, the people, the renters are going to pay the, you know, you want an uptick in the, in the price of the house for your investor. That's yes. part of where their juice is. So the renter is sort of in, in a lot of ways left in the dark. They don't know what they're going to pay for the house until they get there. Oh, actually, they do. They do. We set the, yeah, we set the price today. So we look what the average appreciation has been over the past five years. Oh. And then the nice thing about my marketplace is it's been pretty steady here. It's been between 4 and 5% every year without having a huge upswing or a huge downswing. So we put it based upon, you know, 4 to 5% per year. And then they know the number that they're agreeing to. And if the market goes up higher, they're not going to pay any extra. And they've basically made a really good decision to get in when they did. If the market goes lower, they've still committed to that number. But us as investors who are putting that deal together, we know that they can't get a mortgage for more than the set amount that the house appraises for. And in general, what we've done, because it has happened already, where it wasn't quite to the number we set, We've adjusted our number and said, we still want you to buy the home. And the investors end up with maybe 15% in 20, instead of 20% return. Gotcha. Okay. So they make juice. Um, so you're going to um, t- tell me about that 15 and 20. I mean, this is an interesting strategy. And I, and I hope that people listening you know, out there, you know, this is, uh, uh, they can take this away and maybe try it in their market. Um, to get 15 or 20% annualized. So I'm going to I'm I'm going to you're calculating in the 45% uh, uh uh increase appreciation of the property. Where where does the how how do I get as an investor the the rest? 
Well, the money actually to the investor comes out when the home is sold to that tenant. There's a little bit of extra cash flow as we go along because the the tenants are paying not only the going market rent, but they're also paying in addition uh, an, what we call an option premium, which is to help them save towards their down payment. So there's a little bit of extra cash flow for the investor, which makes it nice because it carries very well. So when they go to buy another property, the mortgage company says, well, this one's more than carrying itself. We have no issues. You can have another mortgage. So, but the... Um, investors really don't have that rate of return until they sell the house because it's really all coming from the appreciation through the leverage. They'll have to put down generally 20% of the purchase price today. And then when they sell it three years from now, that's when they're getting all their money back out and their return. And when you annualize it, that's when on average it's working out to about 20%. Okay, let me let me tell you. I just did, I, it's so funny. I got a call this morning. I got a call from a title company. I, I'm I'm doing this to one of my properties today. Let me tell you how I did it, and it was the first time I did it. I wrote the contract. I you know, and <clears throat> you tell me what I did wrong. Okay, so I bought this this ranch. It was uh, I'm in San Diego, so I bought this this a little ranch. You know, I mean, uh, it's five acres, and again here in San Diego, that's a little ranch, and it's an equestrian property. There's a horse corral on it and everything else. So <clears throat> these I, I had it listed for sale. Um, uh, three, two, two and a half years ago, and um, th- everybody wanted that. Th- this was actually sort of a li- kind of a like a famous property in in Lakeside, California, and it's kind of famous because uh, it was called uh, uh, Angel Acres, and uh, the the former person uh, they had like a camp for kids, so everybody knew this property. So I had this property. I put it on. I put it out there for sale. Um, everybody came to me, and they really couldn't. They couldn't pull the trigger. So I decided, okay, listen, I will carry the note. I found these people and they couldn't qualify. They, they couldn't qual- They couldn't get a loan. Um, yeah. They had a g- good, solid business, but their credit looked terrible. Um, so, so I said, okay, give me, I think I asked, I, I pro- sold the property for 400 grand, 397 or something. Um, okay. Uh, I, I, I said, uh, I only, I wanted 20 grand down. Right. They, they ended up giving me 17 grand. That was okay. I told them, okay, the, at that time, the, the super, like what was being advertised for, for interest rates was like 4.5%. So I said, listen, I'm not going to give you 4.5% because I'm carrying it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to add, I'm going to take the, the really good rates out there. I'm going to add, tack on two points. So, so I said, I said, okay, we're going to amortize it at 6.5%. Number one, they said, okay. <clears throat> number two, um, when, I, when I calced in the, the, uh, the monthly payment, I didn't do it on a 30-year amortization table. I, I did it on a 10-year amortization table. <clears throat> so, so what that did for me is that cranked up their monthly rate. So if they would have financed it over 30 years, you know, let's say their payment would have been 1800 bucks, you know, they write me a check for 3200 bucks every month. <clears throat> right. Okay. The contract uh, that I wrote... Because they, for some reason, they, they couldn't get their minds around the rent to own. <clears throat> they were like, well, that, we, we don't feel like, they didn't feel like they were buying it. And I didn't want to write a mortgage. And I didn't want to write a mortgage because <clears throat> if they defaulted, I was really scared about how hard it was going to be to get them out of the house. For sure. So I wrote something called the land contract. Have you ever heard, or a contract for deed. Have you ever heard of those? Uh, no, I have not. <clears throat> yeah, not many people. It's something that they use in the Midwest for a lot, uh, a lot. but it's it's sort of like a, a hybrid between a rent to own and a mortgage. So the title stayed in my name. <clears throat> um, uh, so title stayed in my name, but but it was you know if they fulfilled that contract, they got the deed. <clears throat> um, so anyhow, um, I'm I'm in the situation today that in November, which is four months or so from now, is when the contract is up, but they want to pay it off early <clears throat> and. Um, you know, again, I don't know how he, so, um, so for me, so I, I bought the house cash for two sixty. I sold it for three. I put another, let's say I have two eighty into the house. I sold it. For, okay. I sold it for three ninety seven. So I made some money on, on the sale <clears throat> and then I'm, yep. and then I'm making money on the, I'm making the two points on the stream, um, <clears throat> which equates to, uh, in terms of interest, like I make about. The, out of that thirty two hundred bucks a month, you know, about seventeen hundred is interest that I get per month, which is kind of cool. Like that's you know, yeah, that's excellent. So um, I don't know. So what what did I do really good on that deal, or is that like what do you think about that? 
I think you did excellent on that deal. And, you know, the fact that they're wanting to buy you out early, yeah. Yeah, there's nothing There's nothing wrong with that. Um, we allowed that on all of our rent-to-owns. We, we just proportion, you know, if we've calculated 5% per year and they buy it one year early, then it's going to be, the price is going to be 5% less. So that's how we mm. calculate it. In, in this case, it's a little bit different because you've already got an agreed-upon price yeah. and they're just buying you out early. So, you know, maybe you're making a, a little bit less interest because they're buying you out early. But overall, that's a fabulous deal because you made 107 on the sale, and and then 1700 a month in interest. Yeah. Well. Well. I, I, and early on, I make like 1700 now. Early on, it was more, right? Because again, it was a a, yeah. th- a three year note with a ten year amortization. Um, <clears throat> Um, yeah, you know, I'll tell you. So, so this is, um, you know, one of the things that you do, Roy, is is when somebody comes to you, you said you do your due diligence, right? You look at their credit, you make sure that they can buy that note out in in three years. Now, now I struggled with this. You know, I, I'm a good guy. I want to be a good guy. A lot of people came to me and said, "Hey, I want you to carry the note. I'll give you fifty grand down. I'll agree to your price." But I looked at their their credit. And what they did for a living, and I'm like, You're, there's no way. I knew I was going to be taking that house back. Um, yeah, and, and I could have played you, that game. You did the right thing. You did the right thing to not take those people. Yeah, I, I mean, just ethically, I, uh, you know, I'm leaving money on the table, but ethically, I think that I would, I, I just, I don't know, morally, well, I just it, couldn't do it. Well, and we, when we do this, we're doing this to help people. We're not doing it to um, try to get the house back. And and that's often a misconception about this because there's a lot of people that are not registered real estate agents. I'm also a registered mortgage broker and, and there's people that aren't licensed the way that I am. And they may do something in, a, in an effort to get the house back and make some money on those people. Our goal is to have it to be a win-win. We truly want those people to take the home at the end of the three years. We want them to be able to get that mortgage. If we feel they're not going to be able to, we, we reject them for the program because we're, we're not looking to upset people by letting them get into a program that they're not going to be able to complete. That's, right. For us, that's not a win-win, and, and a win-win is very important to us. I completely agree. Um, so, so tell me about you have this interesting program. I mean, and, and you know, and with what you do, Roy, um, is it? I mean, is this an offshoot of of your typical real estate business, or is this your main business? Uh, this is an this is an offshoot, and it probably accounts in the neighborhood of maybe only twenty percent of my business at this point in time. However, I see it as a growing area because here in Canada, where I am, they have they keep changing the rules for mortgages to make it more and more difficult. And there's a lot of people that just can't quite get a mortgage, but given a little bit more time, they could. And instead of them, you know, not getting any house or just continuing to rent and then happening to move again, this gives them that hybrid in between that works well for them. My regular uh, business is much like many other realtors. It's based upon repeat and referrals. Okay. Okay and uh, building relationships with my clients and with those that refer to me. That is still 80% of my business. Got it. Um, let me, let, and I want to talk about your typical business or traditional business in a second. In terms of this rent-to-own program, you know, have you tried it with, with other types of property, right? So uh, you're certainly doing it with single family, but what about, you know, multifamily? You know, what about, you know, getting up into actually, you know, big corporate deals? I mean, is this a viable, you know, let's say, I, let's say there's a, I mean, it could be anything. It could be a, you know, a 40 room hotel or, you know, w- what do you think about moving upstream with that? I think, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing for me to think about and I haven't really thought too much about that yet and I I think it's because of my own mindset that once we get into something bigger along those lines I'm feeling that you know if the deal's there that an investor will just take over that kind of whole deal without it happening to be a rental and they'll just do it themselves or they'll have so many buyers because the the other difficulty is if we get into something that's uh, attractive like a multifamily we end up with more buyers and if there's more buyers we'll end up into a multiple offer situation and that's not helpful for this because part of what helps make it great for investors is we do our 
we do our very best to buy it below the market price. Right. Sometimes you're still going to pay market if the numbers all work out and everything will work out for the client. However, it works out best for the investor, even if it's just a little bit below market value, because that allows them to make some profit on the buy going in. And as we know from investing, it's important you make some profit right off the gate on your way into a deal. Yeah, because I mean, look, you know, with you know, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I, my, I have a long, long background of of investing in real estate, and you don't make money when you sell it; you, you make money when you buy it. Correct. Um, yeah, this is this is interesting. I, I um, it, it's it's a, a lot of people when they think about investing in anything, whether it's a stock market or real estate, you know, that's there's a lot of fear around it, right? And so I would call, you know, I'm a I'm an actual investor. There's a, a lot of people who 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 could invest, but they're, I would call them civilians. <clears throat> and I think this model is, uh, is uh, especially if you could buy it well, um, it, it really is a path for civilians to get in there and, and uh, you know, do some investing, you know, make, some, <clears throat> make a good return of 15, 20% and sleep good at night. Oh, absolutely, because they're helping people. And we even do many of them as a joint venture. So we go to different real estate investing clubs and seminars and that kind of thing. And we do a bit of a presentation and we let people know you can start small with this. You can put in and be part of a joint venture on a property and put in as little as $5,000. So it's not like we're asking you to put the whole 20% down on a $300,000 property where you're risking $60,000, you know, potentially. No, you can start with a joint venture It'll be managed. You will be that joint venture will be registered on the title. So again, you're protected by the real estate. You have a say in it, and you can start small. And then once people start small and they like it, and we go past the three years and it's sold and they get their return, then they're like, maybe I'll do the whole next one myself. I'll own right. it all myself instead of being just part of a joint venture. How interesting. Um um, what about you, Roy? So, I mean, I, I mean, you're doing a ton of work for everybody. Um, you know, do you, is there, is, do you just get your just commission or do you get some management fee um, as part of that or? I take uh, just the commission of the sale of the property, uh, when I represent the investor that's purchasing the property. So, I do also have a rent-to-own specialist that works with me, and his name's Thomas Wong. He's a fantastic numbers guy, and he will manage the project, and many times he will put all the investors together. So he takes an assignment fee at the beginning, usually in the neighborhood of $5,000, and it's a one-time fee at the beginning, and he also puts in uh, a small investment and takes a, a share of the profit. But even after his share of the profit, there's still returning in the neighborhood of 20% to the investor. So, and it's clearly all uh, shown to everyone. Here's uh, the exact spreadsheet. Here's what everyone's getting. And we call Thomas the deal finder because he's putting the investors together and he will manage that uh, project as well. So he's the one who will stay in touch with, um, with the tenant and, and that kind of thing and look after anything that the home needs. So he's kind of doing the property management side of it as well. Right, right. And you're making sure that the, that rent gets collected because I, you know, not everybody just sends in their rent on time. And I have some other renters that, you know, I, yeah, I, again, I'm kind of a nice guy. Yeah, I've given everybody like, Hey, your rent's due on the first, but I'm not going to charge you a late fee till, you know, till it gets to the six. So I'll give you five, you know, grace days. And the problem is people like when I do that, people think, oh, my rent's due on the fifth, not the first. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> so true. And, you know, we have come up with a system to help um, stop that. And what it is, is we allow these people to earn an extra $200 every month. And this is where our rent owns probably different from every other rent owned out there. So besides the, the money that they're paying over and above the regular rent, we will give them credit for another $200 every single month if they pay on the first. So they're pretty motivated to pay on the first because they know if they don't, there goes $200 that they could have had towards their down payment when they go to buy the home. Interesting. Uh, that is that is interesting. Uh, two hundred bucks is a that's a lot of money. I mean, you, you so if you pay in the first, you get every month you get two hundred bucks, or is it exactly? And you know, it was Thomas Wong who came up with this, and I said to Thomas, "Why are we 
you know, giving away that $200. And he said to me, Roy, it's simply because we don't need it and we want the tenants to win and we want them to pay on the first. We don't need it because even without it, we're still averaging 20% for the investors and, and that's enough. So instead of them getting 22 or more, this works out better and it makes us different from every other rent owner out there and it helps these tenants pay on time. Huh. Uh, I got to think about that one, at least for my properties. Okay. Well, um, so on this, before we move on to just, just how, you know, just how, what you do with your regular business, is there anything that, that, uh, that people should know about this program? I mean, look, would you encourage someone if they're out there, you know, growing their business, should they uh, uh, like try to do this a couple times or? Uh, I I think everyone should. It's an excellent part of business that's going to continue to grow. The reality is that most of the agents don't understand it. So when they run into it in my marketplace, they'll call me up and they'll ask me to handle it and, and send them a referral fee, which I'm more than happy to do. Um, however, if they took a little bit, bit of time to understand it, understand how the contract works, um, they would really probably start to do it more as well. And there is a couple of th key things that people should know about this. We really want to make sure that people are committed and want to buy because they all the money that they put down up front and the money that they're paying extra every month, they do not get back if they do not buy the home. Right. And we're not trying to take that money, but the reality is if they don't buy the home, that means we either have to find another rent owned tenant, which may or may not match up with that house, or we're going to sell the home. And realistically, we're probably going to sell the home because our investors you know, had an in and out strategy and they want to get their money back out and, and either move it to something else or move it to another rent owned project. And as soon as we need to sell it, well, now we've got additional expenses because we're going to list it with probably me as their realtor. Mm, got it. Okay. Okay. So we've had, we've had a couple um, that I've done many of them and I've had a couple that didn't work out. And usually it's a family breakdown. Mm. It could also be a job loss. Like, you know, things happen in life. So even the best laid plans don't always work out. Um, the two that I'm thinking of are specifically where uh, the families, you know, broke up. And in one case, we re-rented the property to actually a corporation, and those people paid us a premium because they went on a short-term six-month lease, and they end up staying three years. Well, all of that worked out well because they were paying a, a great rate rental rate for us, and at the end, we sold the property, and all the investors got their share. The other one, um, the uh, husband ended up leaving the country. He went back to the country he was from. And the wife was like devastated and unfortunately, you know, couldn't continue payments without him. Right. They had over improved the property. They really had planned to stay. Hmm. So with the fact that they over improved the property, even when we sold the property, there were funds left over and then we gave a bit extra to the lady to help her along her way because she was almost kind of orphaned. Oh my God. Wow. <clears throat> you guys have a conscience, man. I mean, you know, and look, I've been in situations like that a lot, and I, I, I tend to do the same thing, right? I give something back, even though like I, I struggle with that man. I, I really do, Roy. I'm, I, I struggle with going. This is business, and then hey, like I'm a human being, and I want to help that person. Um, and I think I sort of usually default to the human being side, unless you've given me grief, and then I go, look, it's a business thing. Like if you are, your problems sure. are your own. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. So, okay, let's talk about your other 80%. Um, uh, so you have, uh, apparently, you know, it looks 80% of your business is referral and repeat business. How, That's correct. So how long have you been doing this? I'm 11 years now. That's it? Business. Yeah, that's it. At what point, Roy, did you did did your business become? You know, when did it tip over into 50% or 51% repeat and referral? How many years into it for you? Um, I would say it, that was probably at around the five-year mark. However, I was surprised myself because when I got in this business, I thought, oh, um, no one will be moving until they're probably at least in their home like four to five years. Well, I found within two years, people started moving. And of course, referrals started even sooner because, you know, I have a sales background. My background was uh, selling automobiles. So 
I typically ask people for additional business, and I really found if, if I could make one deal lead to another deal, lead to another deal, and another deal, that was the way to connect them all. And and so even right away, referrals started, mostly from me asking. However, those referrals kept going, and then the repeats started, and around the five-year mark is where we, we tipped over that 51%. Amazing, amazing. <clears throat> Look, that is something that people – you have to ask. I want to. I want to find out how you did it. But what I want to point out to the audience is, you have to ask for for ask people for referrals. And people don't do it. People think, oh man, look, I great gave great service. I treat these people right. You know, blah blah blah. Referral is going to be organic, and that is not true. How did would you number one? Would you agree with that? And two, how did you go about asking for referrals? I totally agree with that. You have to continually ask. And one of the neat things, uh, one of my very first deals was a lady who used to be a realtor. So she understood my situation. And, and I just said to her, you know, I'm a new realtor and I need to grow my business. And who else do you know I should stay in touch with that would, you know, be buying a home soon? And she immediately said to me, well, you need to stay in touch with my daughter. She's going to buy a home shortly. And sure enough, you know, she bought within a couple of months Wow! and she was a buy and a sell, you know, and then the people that, um, bought that home, I also sold their home. So then, but end up becoming a chain. And of course that uh, lady even repeated, she opened up a, a small business and needed to lease some space. And even though I'm mostly residential, leasing a little bit of office space is pretty easy for me as well. And we worked and helped her with that deal as well. So you just have to, you know, ask for the business. Also, you have to stay in touch because it, you know, we are bombarded as consumers by other realtors. So there's always more ads, more flyers, many, many things that come to bring another realtor into their mind. And I want them still to keep me at the top of their mind. Right. And so the way for me to do that is to stay in touch through newsletters, emails. I phone them on their birthday. I phone them on their anniversary of their house purchase. And I just check in. And at the same time, I'll ask them if they know anyone else who's looking to buy or sell a home this year that I could help out. Got it. Okay, yeah, that's good stuff. And I'll tell you something. So, so one thing, Roy, that that I'm hearing from you um, is is hustle, right? A lot of people, if they, you know, it, and people who are not even successful yet in real estate, you know, if somebody came to them and said, "Hey, I want you to lease something for me," you know, they they think, "Oh, that's not a big enough payday for me, so I'm not going to do it." And you know, so you will go out and do a lease. You will, you know, put the extra work in and do this this rent to own stuff. Um, I, I mean. Would, would you agree that there's sort of a lack of hustle out there with real estate agents? Oh, I, I would totally agree. You know, and I even see it uh, in my own office where there's some people that, you know, I'll hear them say, oh, well, this one was a really difficult one. Well, well what did it entail? Well, I, I had to drive a half an hour away. Oh. Well, what is that, right? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? 30 minutes. Like, yeah, or maybe, you know, their total investment was like it took me 10 hours or I had to show this buyer, you know, 15 homes. Well, I remember when I started out, I took one buyer and showed them 16 homes. And at the end of the day, they bought the last one. How funny. That was hustle, right? Yeah, that was totally. Hustle. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, I can't, there's a guy that came on the show. I can't, I, I can't really remember his name. Um, Woodman, Aaron Woodman, I think it is. <clears throat> um, he, some, he, a girl came to him and said, hey, uh, you know, we would love to buy a house. We're getting married. We can't buy a house, <clears throat> but we, we, we need to find a rental. So he wasn't super busy. He's like, okay, no problems. I'll find you. He went out, found them a rental. Two years later, they, bought a, uh, a, they came back to him and bought a $2 million house. Uh, wow. Uh, well, hold on a second. Seven years after that, they came back to him and they bought a forty million dollar house. Oh my gosh, that's amazing! Amazing, but because you know, again, he hustled and you know what what other people turned down. You know, he put those people in his funnel and and did just what you did, right? Just just kept following up and kept in touch. I do the same thing as well. I also will do rentals. So I have a number of people that have bought investment properties with me, and I'm a real estate investor myself. I own sixteen properties myself, so. I find renters for my own properties. I also find them for my investors. And I always tell those renters, I know you're renting right now, but when you go to buy, it would be my pleasure to help you. Would that be okay? 
Right. And they almost always say yes, because they've just had a great interaction with me. I'm going to be in touch with them when they're coming up to the end of their lease, and I'm going to remind them, hey, are you ready to buy a home now? Yes, I am. Okay, let's go ahead and help find you a place. And it just turns into that kind of story. I haven't had the $40 million right. sale yet, right. Right. <laughs> but the, it is great to work with renters as well. And again, that's additional business that other realtors don't want to do because they're saying there's not enough pay in it. And, and honestly, here, there's more paperwork to do a lease and a lease a rental than there is to do a sale. So the people are like, oh my gosh, I have to do all this extra paperwork. And ultimately, you know, I get a smaller paycheck. Well, you got to look at the long picture and you got to look at the help you're giving those people and what it's going to return down the road. I agree. Yeah, Canada, you guys are I have a coaching client in Canada and uh you guys are super stringent on a ton of stuff. Um <clears throat> just real quick, you sold cars. Uh and then yes. you, and then you start selling real estate. You've been in the game for 11 years and now you have 16 houses? No, you yeah, have 16 rentals, so you have 17 houses. Yes, exactly. Well, yeah, because my primary home is my, in my wife's name. Got it. <laughs> but that is it exactly. And, you know, I, I started buying in Florida as well because of the, the price, what happened with the, the discounting in, in the States due to, you know, the, the housing crash there. So three of mine are in the States and I have them run by property management there. The rest of mine are up here and I run them myself. And of that here, four of them are rent to own. The rest are long-term hold plans for myself. That's your retirement plan. Um, so, so at, again, there, there's, there are people out there listening in this audience that, uh, well, I, I have people who run big brokerages and I have people who are just getting their license. So it's all, all over the map. But I think everybody would, would love to say, hey, in 10 years or 11 years in your case, you know, I'd love to own 16 houses. And fundamentally, fundamentally my, my you know, old age stuff is taken care of. At, at what point, um, when did you, through selling real estate, did you get enough money to go, yeah, okay, I'm going to buy that one? Yes. Uh, and even before I felt I had enough money, it was time to start buying. And, and I got motivated by a seminar that, that we put on at Keller Williams and my office puts it on and it's called the Millionaire Real Estate Investor Seminar. And once I attended that, like I got so excited, I ran out and I bought a brand new home. And then I I leased that one out and it got leased right away. And then I realized how huge the demand is for rental. Hmm. And that home I wanted to keep forever. And ultimately, the person who leased it from me was a friend of mine. And at the end of the day, she said, I, I just have to buy this house. I've had it since brand new. And I explained how I wanted to keep it forever because it's part of my retirement plan. But as soon as she got my wife on side, my wife said, listen, it's just bricks and mortar. We'll buy another one. <laughs> <laughs> then, it, then the sale happened. And, of course, that's when I took the money and I bought a couple in Florida with it, which I think are great investments because, you know, our winters up here are so harsh. Yeah. I'd like to spend a little bit more time in Florida. But right now they're just long-term rentals there. But ultimately I will probably spend, you know, four months a year in Florida as I as I age, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, you creaky old bones, man. Can't handle the, those cold, wet, snowy winters. Uh, <laughs> they are crazy here. Yeah. Uh, where, where are you, by the way? My my guy, my coaching client is in Ottawa, and he tells me that it gets negative forty. Oh yeah, we we get the same stream here. It runs uh, west to east, so we actually get it first. We're southwest of there. I'm in Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario. Gotcha. Um, how does, you know, again, some, some people are, they're getting pumped up listening to your story, Roy, and they're like, you know what? Yes, I want to, I would love to have a rental house. How, you know, is there any, how can they do that? Let, let's say they, you know, they're, they're brand new. They really don't have a pile of cash. You know, maybe they don't have, uh, you know, super great credit. I mean, is there, is there some sort of way that they can, they can leverage a, a, an investor? Like how? I don't know. I'm asked, that's a crazy question, but tell me your thoughts on that. Well, there's always partnerships, right? I mean, if they find a deal, so they search, the key thing is to really search for the deal first, because right. that's really the hard part. Once they find a great deal, they could talk to other people in their office, other investors that they might have run across. They could even advertise the deal. You know, on uh, here we have Kijiji's the most popular or on a Craigslist or something like that and say, like, here's the deal. And I'm looking for an investor. And so maybe they get a part ownership for their first one. Mm. Or maybe they talk to their family and they go to their family and say, you know, here's what I've got. 
and we could each own a part. Um, however, you do have to be careful with that because, you know, you need to have almost an extra agreement because at some point, you know, you and your family might not agree on the way that that property is run and you'll want to go your own way as soon as you, you know, start to sell some and have some more money to work towards other properties or if you remortgage them down the road and pull out some equity. Right. And look, I'll tell you, that is the, the thing. If you can find a deal, you can find the money. You know, I, I've, I, for me, finding money is easy. Um, it, but the, and the finding the deal part is hard. That's so true. That that's exactly what it is. So find that deal. Uh, hey, look, Roy, we're going to wrap up here. Um, I, I'm going to ask you a question that I don't ask everybody, but uh, you know, you you you're, you you've talked about a lot of different things that people haven't talked about on the show before. <clears throat> and here's the question: What is something I didn't ask you, but I should have asked you? Um, I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. Yeah, nothing really that I can think of other than, you know, how do you get into real estate? And maybe you ask people that because, you know, a lot of us get into real estate by accident. I looked at getting into real estate in the 90s, but the, the interest rate here went crazy. It went up to 21% and people were getting out Holy of the real smokes. estate business. So I stayed in the car business during that time because I loved the car business and I loved the selling and I was a sales manager. Ultimately, I invested in a, um, in a triplex with my brother-in-law and that's how I, I know that it's better to have an exit agreement. <laughs> right. And... That's what kind of got me excited about real estate. And I, and I owe a lot to my brother-in-law because he's the one, we both talked about the fact that, you know, we should really learn what these real estate agents do and we should just take the course. And that was kind of talk. And then one day he called me up and he said, hey, I've just called the Ontario Real Estate Association. I've ordered my course. And I said, excellent. Thanks very much. I hung up and I called and ordered mine at the exact same time. So him and I both got into real estate at the same time, and we're both still realtors, and we have you know so much fun talking about real estate in the market, and we still call each other up and pick each other's brains, and we eventually sold that property that we had together because it wasn't, for us, an ideal investment property because it was a very, very old house that had, you know, a number of issues. And once we sold it, I know he's invested in a number of rental properties, and I have too, and and it's just continued to blossom for both of us. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, uh, look, I, I, I love it, Roy. Thanks for coming on the show. I always ask, my last question I, I normally ask is this. I'm an aspiring agent. I have 25 bucks. What book should I go buy today? Oh, without a doubt, you have to go and buy the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book uh, written by Gary Keller. That is like a blueprint on how to become a millionaire real estate agent. I totally agree. And look, if anybody has not read that book or gotten that book, you can get a free copy using our link. Just use audibletrial.com slash superagentslive. And uh, that's, our, that's our deal with Audible, and they'll give you a free month free. You can get that book. I'm going to start excluding that book, Roy, because uh, <laughs> everyone's saying it. Everybody says it. <laughs> yeah. what, what other book? I, I think uh, another really good book is uh, Napoleon Hill's uh, Think and Grow Rich. My it favorite. just helps get your your mindset in the right in the right place. I'll tell you what that uh, for me for me uh, uh, Think and Grow Rich. Um, uh, the Millionaire Agent uh, by Gary Keller and Dave and Jay pops on. And by the way, we've had yeah. yeah, I told you we've had both Jay and Dave on the show, um, right? Uh, and, and and you know the other book that I would say, like if you're going to start a library, I, I love Anthony Robbins' Awaken the Giant Within. Oh yes, I had the CDs. They are fantastic. It's old, but man, that is so good, so great stuff. Hey Roy, hey man, thank you for coming on the show. Um, if people want to reach out and say thank you for for you know spending time and sharing some of your strategies, where can people find you? I, I think the easiest way is if they shoot me an email, and uh, an email would be uh, just my name at uh, Gmail. So it's R O Y C L E E V E S at gmail.com Roy Cleaves at gmail.com boom hey everybody uh, if you uh, if you love this uh, send Roy an email and say thanks hey Roy thanks again and uh, let's keep in touch thanks so much I appreciate it talk to you soon bye for now let's go 